welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we learn why you never let the marketing team make your decisions for you. The Gibson Corvus. This is one of the stranger guitars from the early to mid 80s and there's actually a very good logical explanation why this guitar looks like that, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So first, let's dive into the Futura and Corvus history. The Gibson Corvus was first introduced in 1982 and only lasted two years until 84. The higher-end Futura was one year later, 83 to 85. Neither of these were particularly well received by the market. The Corvus was considered a budget line model that was introduced alongside these other models, the Challenger and the Invader. Now the Invader and Challenger, they're basically just bolt-on neck Les Pauls. The Challenger has the same electronics that you'll find within the Corvus. But the Corvus has always had a soft spot in my heart because it's just so doofy looking. You can't help but love them. It is clearly quite the ugly duckling. But despite being an entry-level guitar, you actually had three different lineups within these things. There's the Corvus 1, 2, and the 3. The Corvus 1, it just has one humbucker, the wraparound tailpiece, master volume, master tone, very simple guitar. The 2 just adds another pickup, then you get a selector switch and an additional volume control. And then the 3 has to be the coolest because you get three, count them, three single coil pickups in a Gibson and a blade style switch. But what all three versions of the Corvus had in common was the Corvus truss rod cover, a single ply black pick guard, an intonatable wrap tail piece, a bolt-on maple neck with an alder body, and lastly, an output jack located on the front. Now, let's talk about this guy. So, this is a Corvus, but it's so high-end they had to change the name to something else, the Futura. But basically what makes this thing different is it has a bridge and tailpiece set up in gold hardware. You get the double pickup like the Corvus 2. You get the speed knobs that are of a regular quality and the output jack is located on the side. That's one of my favorite things about these. And a five ply plastic pick guard. You also get an ebony fretboard instead of rosewood. But the thing that makes this most special is it is not a bolt on neck. It's actually rumored that these are made out of a single piece of maple, body and neck combined. However, that's complete utter garbage, trash, false information that's been spread. How do I know? Well, I asked Mr. Leonard, the guy who built some of these things. They're just a set neck. But why this freaky design? This guitar was actually designed by a guy named Chuck Burge. He was part of Gibson's research and development team at the time. Headless guitars were all the rage right now, so essentially what he was trying to do was develop Gibson's first headless guitar. So this little strange V Pac-Man cutout can opener shape here, he was initially going to be putting the tuners down here and developing something that Gibson had never done before. After Bruce Bolin approved the design, one prototype was made as headless, and they sent it on down to the marketing team, which was currently in Asheville, and they said, no, it needs a head. So they put this headstock on it. Now you can call it whatever you want, like the black banana, but the designer called it the Limp Richard headstock, to put it nicely. So they really messed up the entire vibe of this guitar by putting a headstock, they made it unbalanced, and just made it a weird, strange piece of Gibson history. Now if you don't understand what we mean by a headless guitar, we're talking there is no headstock. Like remember my headless SG that somebody converted to this way? Yeah, so there was no headstock, they just had the tuners built into the bottom side of it. Here's an approximation of what it would have looked like or something like this with Clusen tuners. Some fans of this model have even gone as far as building a tribute to what the original design could have looked like. I don't think these would have been all that popular anyways, but we could have had a very different story from, oh yeah, those weird can opener guitars to, oh yeah, those weird headless guitars that Gibson made in the early 80s. 
But the name Corvus is actually Latin for crow. And the reason for it being called that is this was supposed to look like a bird in flight. You got his head right here, he goes tweet tweet, and then you got your little flapping wings down here. That's the shape that they were going for. Whether you see that, the can opener, or the Pac-Man, it's just a strange shape in general. Why was the Futura called the Futura? I don't know. <laughs> there was already a guitar called the Futura, and in 2014 they named something else the Futura. There are so many Futuras in Gibson history, it's, it's kind of unfortunate to be honest. But is there any type of collector's market to these guitars? Well, clearly the Futuras are more collectible, but they're not necessarily highly expensive guitars. The Futura actually only had three. You had black, a pearl white, and an ultraviolet finish. This example is pearl white. It's essentially like a slightly sparkly white color. You can check out this Les Paul custom video to see one that hasn't aged quite as much. But the Corvus is actually one of the most difficult guitars to get a complete collection of because they made them in so many different colors. The base color being silver with six additional options that were a little bit more expensive brand new. That list includes silver, antique natural, ebony, orange, red, electric blue, and lastly, the rarest of the colors is yellow metallic. It's so rare, I can't even find a photo of it. So from a collector's standpoint, it'd be relatively easy to get one of each color of the Futuras. But imagine trying to hunt down seven individual colors for the Corvus 1, 2, and 3. 21 perfect examples. That's going to be a lifelong journey. Now that we know all about the history of the Gibson Futura slash Corvus, let's go ahead and throw this Corvus on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside the Corvus, here's what we got going on, a giant swimming pool route. So technically, if you have a Corvus 1 and you want a Corvus 3, all you have to do is find a pickguard assembly in the pickups from another guitar or a Challenger to convert it into whatever one you want, because the bodies are pretty much the same. This is exactly what my Futura looked like as well. So even if you don't want to convert it to factory stock specs, you could, you know, have a whole bunch of different stuff in here. I think it'd be a lot of fun to put like some pure vintage 65 Jazzmaster pickups in one of these. So it's kind of cool from a modding perspective. But inside here we can see it says S4 for some reason. Then it looks like an R and like maybe a D for red or something like that. But here you can see how it was routed out and they just left that channel there. That way they would have some legs for the pickups to go into. And here you can see the wood. I'll let you guys tell me what it is. It kind of looks like mahogany to me, but the spec sheets online usually say alder. But I do know sometimes Gibson would just use whatever they have. But feel free to chime in in the comment section below. Then it routes down a little bit further right here. So if you need like a extra deep push push pot or something like that, you've got that option. But what's kind of strange is really only one of those pots lines up for that. The rest is just for your output jack. As far as the pick guard itself, it's just single ply. I wouldn't call it flimsy flimsy. It's got a good heft to it. It's not going to snap in half, but it's definitely not multiply, but just a very basic output jack. And the regular pots of that era, this one dates to mid-1981. And this one's kind of covered up, but looks about the same. But here's our Bill Lawrence designed pickup. This one just has a sticker in the Tim Shaw date code style, so that dates to 1983. And that wire right there is the ground wire connecting to the bridge post. But speaking of the bridge, the bridge is kind of cool. We've seen one of these before on the Gibson Spirit model. This is basically the Schaller equivalent of the Leo Kwan Badass Bridge. It's marked Made in Germany on the bottom side. And they also number your saddles so you know which one is which. And you'll notice those are brass saddles. Brass was huge in the 80s. But it's actually a two-part system. So even though it's technically a wraparound bridge, you've got a separate here that the strings go through. And then that just slides into place like that. So it's still wrapping around the top, but then you still have individual adjustments for your intonation. So it's kind of an ingenious design, to be honest. I could see myself using that on other guitars. But the biggest difference between a Corvus and a Futura, besides the whole neck, is the Futuras, they actually get smaller as they go down. Like they're gradually thick up here and then they get slimmer on top of the contouring of the edge. 
But the corvuses, they don't do that. They're a little bit chunkier. Maybe that'll help with the neck dive. As far as our pickup reading goes, it reads 8.96k ohms within the circuit. Something else interesting that you'll notice about this humbucker is it has three adjustments. So you can go up and down with these guys and you can actually adjust the tilt with that. Now just for full disclosure, when this guitar came to me, the screw was missing. The spring was still in place miraculously, but I had to replace that with something I had laying around. And this is definitely somebody's workhorse guitar. They've got lots of scratches. You can see where these strings have kind of been pressed within the pickup cover. And there's nicks and dings all over this thing. This is not a collector grade Corvus, but there's not many collectors after Corvuses, but I'm sure there's a few quirky guys out there. I wouldn't mind having a mint condition collection of every single color ever made. But now we get to our fretboard. So specs online usually say rosewood, and this definitely looked rosy before I started cleaning this, but now that I've got it all conditioned and everything, it looks just like ebony, but I'm going to go ahead and say this one's also rosewood based off of the wood grain. And this is another reason why I hate buying guitars when the frets are not polished, because sometimes sellers don't even know about stuff like this. You see these indentations from the strings? That's not normal fret wear, that's from like the strings getting hit against it like this was dropped or something. For example, the strings on here, you take a hammer and you smash it into there. Something similar to that can cause these little divots in the top frets. So sometimes when you bend against that, you can kind of feel some give. And that was not visible until I cleared all the rust and dirt and grime off of this. But that's definitely uh, present on one, two, three, yeah, a little bit right here. So four, five, six seven about seven frets so you'd have to level recrown to get that off of there and i'm not sure what caused that but it looks like a slight impression like maybe they spilled alcohol or something on there i was unsuccessful in cleaning that off but we'll grab our neck dimensions here a nut width of 1.67 inches then by the 12th 2.04 first fret neck depth 0.81 and 0.96 by the 12th so regular 60s style and it's the typical frets of the era with the 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length. As far as the face of the headstock goes, you can see the seam lines on the edges. That's how they created this strange headstock shape. You get your Gibson silk screen, kind of cheapy little tuners, but a cool truss rod cover that reads Corvus. And it looks like our truss rod is in great shape. I guess something kind of unique about being able to see the edge of the neck right there is you can see where they capped off the truss rod cavity with that maple blank. One nice thing about this headstock design, though, is it is perfect straight string pull. So if that's something you're really interested in, the Corvus has got it, man. It's completely straight all the way from back here. But now flipping over to the other side of the body here, it's not too much to talk about. There's no back plates here. It's all top routed just to make them cheaper to produce. Speaking of that bolt on neck with nothing fancy on the neck plate, these were really just, you know, budget entry level type things. Another replaced part you can see is somebody has Schaller strap lock buttons in each of the locations. But hey, this maple neck actually cleaned up pretty nice. There's a little bit of flame figuring in it. I mean, nothing that I would actually call flame flame. Come look at this listing. It's for sale. Super flamed neck like some people might. <laughs> but you have a little bit there to be excited about. But most of it's just nice little wood grain. And here's our serial number. Very early 1984. The fifth day of the year. That's crazy. And 618. Made in USA. And you know, Schaller actually made these tuners because that has the same Schaller footprint here, but we've got the Schaller style tips. So I wonder, could you put the better looking Gibson ones on here? I think you could because it would fit. Looks like we got a little bit of a neck pocket crack right there, which is very common on bolt-on neck style guitars. I don't think that's going to cause you any issues, but it is there. Good to know about. Lastly, this thing's pretty light. Six pounds, six ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds.
this is a guitar for somebody that wants to cut their own path and do something that no one's ever done before, and that is play a Corvus. It's an alright guitar. It's not amazing. It has one pickup that's kind of not all that cool. If you buy this guitar, God bless you. Now, to be completely fair with Michael here, I did edit his words a little bit and made him say what I thought he wanted to say. Also, keep in mind, this guitar was absolutely filthy when he demoed it. It did not have fresh strings on it yet. I hadn't polished up the frets. But honestly, what can I say about this guitar after I've played it? They're still not my favorite, but they're so quirky, you can't help but not love these things more so than the other guitars that were introduced in this series, the Challenger and Invader. Because this is something completely new and freaky, and had they had done the headless design, I think it would be a completely different story for these guys of how they're regarded yet today. It's truly the headstock that <laughs> ruined these guys. The action on this is so ridiculous ridiculously low and it's really comfortable just to kind of sit with this guitar and strum some chords so i think it'd be great for just you know sitting around and playing it however due to bad strap button management it's not the most comfortable to stand and play with this is an incredibly neck heavy guitar like this was not designed to have a headstock on it. So I think that's why it kind of has a weird balance issue going on. There's a reason why the guy in the advertisements is, you know, playing like this, just trying to keep the neck up. <laughs> he looks pretty cool doing it though, but I don't think you want to play the entire show like this, unless you want to just straddle it like that. You really have to fight this guitar to do any type of bending. I don't know if it has something to do with this whole bridge setup, but it's just not the most comfortable guitar in the world to do bends. So are Corvus guitars trash? No. Are they treasure? No. They're just kind of weird pieces of Gibson history that some people pay too much money for just because they're cool colors. There are hundreds of other guitars that you should buy before you spend nearly a thousand bucks on one of these things. But if you love 70s and 80s Gibsons and you love the quirky stuff, these are kind of a, a must-have for every collection in my opinion. Even if it's just for the weird goofy shape and the talking point factor of these things. In my opinion, it's the Tangerine Corvus 3 that you really want. That's the one I'm looking for for whenever I finally get to do that review and demo. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the Corvus. Let's go ahead and check this thing out under blacklight real quick. There we go. Now I have my orange tangerine color one. No, this is the black light green. So I'm not sure about the knobs on this one. They might be original. They might not be because this is kind of in that era where they should glow. But things like the Sonics, they must have got that cheaper quality stuff first because they never glow. So I'll just go ahead and advertise that as it's been replaced. But it looks like as far as the finish goes, it's definitely all original here. We'll take a look at our little neck pocket crack that we saw earlier. Definitely uh, nothing you're going to have to worry about, but it's a little bit of a visual eyesore when you're looking at it. And the back of the neck just glows like crazy. It's been a while since we've had a nice vintage guitar like this one that's glowing beautifully. Cool. As far as the case goes, they kind of get something that looks similar to a Les Paul case. But not quite the same, but it's branded Gibson on the outside. The handprint is not stock. Somebody added that themselves. But one latch here, then another of this style, and one last latch down here. And none on the back, so only a three latch case and a handle right here. And inside this, that's what it looks like. They just kind of get some extra padding up here. Otherwise, you might actually be able to fit a Les Paul in one of these cases. You know what? I'm curious. Yes, it would fit. You would just have to tear out this padding. It doesn't quite compress far enough. Well, I guess you might be able to get away with it. There we go. Yep, you can compress the foam if you really want to fit a Les Paul in here. So if anybody's ever selling the Corvus case for cheap, you can do it. However, that does not go the other way. It'll fit here, but the Corvus headstock's actually a little bit too long. Thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Corvus and Futura guitars. Kind of strange pieces of Gibson history, but well worth knowing about. 
Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.